Hi, good afternoon and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. For those of you still trickling in, um, I want to let you know that we still have plenty of uh, Millennium Development Goals t-shirts that we collaborated with our partner, University of Miami on. Uh, feel free to take one for your friends or family uh, while you're here. Um, my name is Andrew Schwartz. I'm our Senior Vice President for External Relations and I'm very, very fortunate uh, that my partners in this uh, Dean Sam Grog of the University of Miami and Sanjeev Chatterjee, uh, the Vice Dean, are both here. Um, this is, uh, we've been doing this series for about a year now and it just keeps getting better and better and I think we really are able to shed light on some of these crucial issues surrounding the Millennium Development Goals. Today we have a, a, just a stellar panel uh, and I'd like to let my colleague Dan Rundy, uh, who's right here, uh, introduce them, but uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, and visit us at Facebook and visit us at CSIS.org. This session will also be up on iTunes and on CSIS.org uh, afterwards if you want to see it again. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Great. I'm really pleased to have everybody here. I want to especially thank the University of Miami for hosting this. And we're going to be talking today about an underreported issue, which is the issue of science and technology and the Millennium Development Goals. I think those of you that are familiar with international development know that Science and technology have played a crucial role in advances uh, and to end human suffering, reduce human suffering uh, over the last 50 years. Uh, AID uh, has, was at the forefront of initiatives like the Green Revolution in the past, along with private funders such as the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation. There's a renewed emphasis at the, uh, at the, in the Obama administration and under Dr. Shah with a focus on science and technology, and we're particularly pleased to have Alex Deegan, a former colleague um, uh, who's currently now at, the state, at, at AID as the principal advisor for science, with us to my right. <coughs> to my left is a former classmate from the Kennedy School, so it's sort of old home week. Mm -hmm. John MacArthur is the CEO of uh, Millennium Promise, which is an initiative uh, that Dr. Jeffrey Sachs has uh, convened around a series of community development initiatives uh, focused on alleviating poverty, and you'll hear more about that shortly. And then uh, to further to my left is Sasha Kramer, who's an adjunct professor at the University of Miami and also is a visiting fellow at the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Miami based in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, but in, she's also <coughs> wearing her hat as executive director of SOIL, which you'll learn uh, quite a lot about, I think, uh, when she describes uh, what SOIL is and, and what they're doing. Very, I think we have a very interesting panel. I'm going to first ask Alex to set the stage um, on the issue of science and technology. I think what we have here is at the policy level, science and technology, how do we, how do we harness it? How do we capture learning? How do we mainstream it? And then we have two examples of applied technology, both uh, a particular technology in the case of Sasha and in the case of uh, John's organization, we have a series or suite of technologies and how how around community development, how various social practices are brought to bear on technology to, to achieve uh, alleviation of suffering. So Alex, talk, us, uh, talk to us a little bit about this new emphasis on science and technology. How are, how are you thinking about uh, mainstreaming advances in science and technology into mainstream USAID operations? Um, well, science and technology is one of four priorities for the administrator. It's part of our USAID forward agenda, which was an attempt to take the PPD, the QDDR, and actually start it before those, those were even issued. It is uh, a hallmark of this administration in terms of restoring science to its rightful place, and it's a recognition that development is a technical discipline. And 20 years ago, we had a Bureau of Science and Technology. We haven't had a full-time S&T advisor for, not, for, for 19 years. Um, and having Dr. Shaw set out this agenda and, and working on it, I think, is based on the rec recognition that much as USAID played an important part in, in, in sort of the great transformations of the past, whether it be antibiotics or, or vaccines, um, that we need to look toward what are the next sort of transformative agents in the future. How can we actually leapfrog ahead and solve problems rather than making just progress? Um, we recognize that 80% of economic growth around the world is through science, technology, and innovation, that, that, and that we have to actually think about building economies of the future rather than building economies of the past. And we, we, we tend to do so. And, and it is not about repeating the last 200 years of industrialization, but using 
all of our expertise to help develop, you know, in, with people on the ground in the developing world, um, uh, new solutions and, and, and bringing in new solvers to the problems that we have. And last, last week I was actually in California and one of the things that, that, that really impressed me was what was being driven by students at Berkeley, Stanford, and Santa Clara University and many of the spin-offs that came about that, which was first bringing together sort of medicine, engineering, uh, graduate sciences together with anthropology and the business community to set up sort of new social entrepreneurship companies working with people from the developing world and frequently driven by people from the developing world to take on these challenges that we face as a global community and being able to address them. And that has been exceptionally uh, exciting. The other element of it is this is actually a fundamental part of our national security. I mean, we're facing a series of global challenges as a community. Uh, and and you know, we, our previous administration, we went from this idea of American exceptionalism to what was laid out in the Cairo speech, which is this idea of partnership. And recognizing that, thinking about emerging infectious diseases, thinking about water, thinking about climate uh, disruption, think about biodiversity loss, thinking about the connectivity issue, the divides between those who are connected and are unconnected. How do we actually address these? And what's clear is, you know, we're not just bordered by Canada and Mexico anymore, but what happens in, in other countries, what happens in Antana and Arevo, increasingly spills on our shores. And we need to address these problems because the nature of the problems are scientific problems. The natures of the solutions require partnership. And one of the great things science does is bring us some of that partnership. Um, just briefly at USAID, what we're trying to do is uh, part of this science agenda, and particularly our focus for this year, is around four things. And the first is, is building capacity back at USAID in terms of science, technology, and innovation. And, and what that means is, you know, first and foremost, rebuilding our technical capacity that we lost when we went from 15,000 people to 2,000 people, but actually had to deal with a, almost, you know, a substantial increase in the size of our budget. We lost the ability, with the exception of a few bright spots, to recognize success, to understand success. And, and enhancing sort of the existing expertise that's in the agency, rewarding and celebrating that expertise that's within the agency, creating uh, opportunities for a senior technical career track, creating senior science advisor positions, in our bureaus, within our missions, is fundamental to how we're actually going to get science back into recognizing that development is a technical discipline. Um, getting people access to journals, encouraging people to go to conferences, which people were discouraged from doing so. Letting people actually, through procurement reform, have the time to focus on the nature of the problems themselves. Really tr turning USAID from a piggy bank to actually a development partner with people on the ground with people in around the world is fundamental to what I think it'll take for success. Second is recognizing everything we do is place-based, but we haven't been able to use geospatial technologies, for instance, in what we're trying to do. So when you're thinking about putting an HIV clinic someplace, right, we should be thinking about disease prevalence, other co-occurring diseases prevalence, population densities, where DFID has their clinics, where the government has its clinics, what the road and transportation network is, and doing that and actually having that information before we even go into countries and using that for project evaluation to analysis. I mean, it's not about maps. It's actually about using a systems approach, and that's what GIS is, to development. The third are a series of grand challenges for development that the administrator will soon launch. But it's thinking about really the, the big problems, the big solvable problems that are in development, and then focusing on critical barriers. And so some of the ideas are if we're looking at child and maternal health, ensuring that all women at the time of delivery have access to medical care. What about, you know, as we think about agricultural productivity, how do we increase yields which have been going down year after year despite our efforts to invest in increasing those yields while decreasing our environmental footprint? You know, how do we ensure that all children with three years of education can read? I mean, fundamental issues. How do we ensure that villages and deep rural communities have access to electricity, which is part of the key to actually being able to read? So being able to not only um, address major challenges as a way of furthering the Millennium <coughs> Development Goals, but also other problems that, you know, th the key characteristic of development is that it's not static. The context in which it occurs changes the populations change, and, and development as a discipline continues to evolve. 
And, but we tend to take an approach that is sort of very time-based. Lastly, it's being able to recognize that we have a lot of resources we haven't tapped into for a long time. And I'm generalizing, there are very many bright spots at USAID, but, but you know, we spend $148 billion on research, federal government research in our federal science cabinet in this country. We don't use that for development. We should use 20%, 20 of our federal uh, d domestic science agency budgets should be directed toward development type issues because one, the nature of those solutions actually affect Americans at home. That what's happening internationally is frequently a development issue. And, and, and two, fundamentally, we can learn things from other places in the world. If we can develop world-class frugal innovations with the help of partners on the ground, then, then we can actually you know, reduce the cost of our healthcare systems in America. And thinking about that. The other aspect of it, um, and we're, we're starting off this, the other aspect of it is empowering people through cooperative research and development. We have a partnership with the National Science Foundation where, where, where NSF is funding American scientists, we're funding uh, developing country scientists to be able to empower them to have the ability to solve their own problems. Get us out, you know, aid should have an expiration date. I mean, we should think about a future of, of, of what will it take to get us out of development fundamentally. And lastly, academia. We really need to re-invite academia as development partners and be able to leverage that. And that's sort of the approach we're taking at aid. Okay, thanks, Alex. So, Sasha, you, necessity is the mother of invention, place-based solutions. Maybe you could talk a little bit about SOIL and how you came to become executive director of SOIL and what is SOIL? Sure. <clears throat> Well, I first went to Haiti in 2004, and I had gone just after the coup that happened there. I went as a human rights observer, and I was still working on graduate school, finishing up in California, and I fell completely in love with Haiti and began going back every month uh, for my last two years of graduate school. And what I found as a human rights observer there was that really the most pervasive human rights abuse in Haiti was poverty and was the fact that people did not have access to basic services. And one of the services that people didn't have access to was sanitation. And I myself often found that I would need to use a facility and would not be able to find one. And for me, it was a real eye-opener about something that I think that most of the world, people who have access to sanitation very much take for granted. So that was when I, I first started thinking about getting involved in sanitation work in Haiti. But when I was looking at poverty and these other basic services that were not available to people, it was clear to me that it was not just a question of sanitation. It was a question of not having access to health care, the leading cause of mortality in children under five in Haiti is waterborne disease, and the fact that agricultural production had been declining so much over the last few decades in Haiti. And this was what got me thinking about, is there a way to have an integrated approach to sanitation that would not only be about a toilet, but that would also address some of these other issues, like healthcare, like agriculture. And I was studying ecology in graduate school and was very interested in nutrient cycles. And so I had been thinking about nitrogen for a long time and studying fertilizers. And I sort of had one of those moments where I realized there is this incredible link between sanitation and agriculture because what is coming out in human waste is, is actually, it's what's causing these public health problems, but if you transform it properly, you can really turn it into a resource that can be used to stimulate agricultural production. So in 2005, I visited South Africa, and I went and visited some ecological sanitation projects there, where they were designing different kinds of toilet systems that could actually transform human waste into fertilizer. And I went back to Haiti and began speaking with some of my, my colleagues there. and. People were really interested in this idea of being able to produce a resource locally, being able to take something that was posing a public health threat and transform it into a resource so that Haitian farmers would not necessarily have to be purchasing fertilizer outside of the country, 
but could actually be producing this for themselves. So in 2006, I co-founded the organization SOIL, which is Sustainable Organic Integrated Livelihoods. And we primarily focus on ecological sanitation and developing sanitation systems that are culturally appropriate and that also can be used to produce this agricultural resource. So we, we founded the organization in 2006, and we were working mainly in rural areas at that time. And when the earthquake happened in January of last year, I went to Port-au-Prince two days after the earthquake, and I took about half of my team with me, and initially we were just involved in sort of immediate emergency relief, so getting food to people, getting water. And around March, I decided it was time to get back into the business of what we really do, which is sanitation. And we partnered with Oxfam Great Britain to test some of our technologies in the IDP camps in Port-au-Prince. And since that time, we've built about 200 toilets in IDP camps throughout the city. And we've set up three, three sort of decentralized <laughs> composting facilities to treat the waste from these toilets. And right now, we have over 100,000 gallons of human waste that has been safely converted into compost. And we're now working on sort of finding ways to market that resource in order to make these sanitation systems sustainable. And when I first got involved with soil, I had these dreams of, you know, we're going to build hundreds of thousands of toilets around the country, and maybe we'll move to other countries after that. And I found that over the last year, in thinking about how are we really going to scale up this technology, I've, we've sort of shifted our focus from saying, we're going to go and build all of these toilets, to saying the way to really scale up an innovation uh, from the perspective of a small NGO is that what we have to offer is that we can pilot this technology. We can show how it can be effective, show how it can actually be profitable, and then the way for it to be scaled up is to pass that on, pass it on to the private sector, pass it on to other organizations, pass it on to the government, and so now when people ask me, how many toilets do you plan to build, or what country do you plan to go to next, I say, really, numbers of toilets for me are not the focus. For me, what I want to do is work out the kinks in this system so that we can demonstrate the effectiveness of this innovative technology, and then pass it on to others who are going to be able to scale it up. So I think that Haiti is where I will stay, and until we can demonstrate that this works, and I just hope that we can provide a model that can be used by others around the world to bring this to scale. So Sasha, you were going to bring some fertilizer with you, but you decided that you were going to have a hard time getting it through customs, and so the, the next time we host this event, you'll, you'll bring some, I will, I will come with a prop next time, and it is, it is very suspicious looking, so I feared I, I wouldn't actually make it into this event if I came with it. But next time, absolutely, I'll, I'll okay. have a sample for you. Good, thank you, good. And so John, you run Millennium, the Millennium Villages Project. Um, we've heard about scale, we've heard about learning, we've heard about innovation, we've also heard about culturally applied or culturally appropriate technology. This must obviously be issues for you at the Millennium Villages Project. Tell us a little bit about it, but also tell us a little bit about how you take technology and make it appropriate in the, in the cultural context you're operating in. Great. Thank you. And uh, thanks to everyone. And thanks to uh, University of Miami and, and CSIS for putting this series together. It's great. And uh, really a privilege to be here. I want to also congratulate uh, Alex and Dr. Shaw and everyone at USAID for putting this at the front of the agenda. I think uh, for those of us who are uh, for lack of better term, professionals in this set of circles, it's uh, quite invigorating to see the leadership. And uh, I was with uh, Raj Shah last week uh, and just congratulated him then because the notion of momentum around evidence based policy making is really taking hold and uh, focusing not just on the evidence but also on what's next, not just where we are. And I think that's the spirit of. A lot of what all of us are trying to work on is where are we now and then what's coming down the pipeline soon and how can we make the most of that on a systems basis. Uh, so I would just maybe want to share some broader framing thoughts first before getting into the specifics because I think as we talk about this issue of innovation, I would uh, have four 
categories of innovation that come into my own mind conceptually, and I'm happy to illustrate a couple of them, uh, and, and in the broader discussion follow up. I think one is probably the most overlooked innovation, which is the implementation of known technologies. This is a huge gap in the international system and international efforts. Uh, and there are, generally speaking, uh, two or three reasons why we don't do more of it. Uh, one is uh, lack of financing. So as much as uh, <coughs> money doesn't solve a problem, if you can't pay for the solution, <laughs> it doesn't get solved either. And that is uh, a, a highly underappreciated issue. And if we go back to, uh, for example, oh, I'll come back to it in a second. The, the other reason is uh, often people just don't know the evidence across disciplines. And so I'm a macroeconomist. I'm maybe a little bit lucky. I've actually spent much more time than most macroeconomists thinking about soil nutrient cycles. <laughs> but I know enough to know how little I know. And I, unfortunately, most of my colleagues don't even know how much they don't know because it's not an issue to them, even in the circumstances where they're looking at, say, uh, African economic development patterns, which are centrally defined, in my view, and read of the evidence by a lot of soil nutrient cycles, a lot of what the agronomic community calls a soil nutrient crisis in much of Africa, where the greatest ecological and economic barriers are around extraction of soil nutrients. Uh, we don't think about this systematically as a policy community. Uh, you could look at the same, say, around uh, epidemiology and disease control. Uh, there's a, the public health community had developed a lot of evidence around the role of, say, mass distribution of long-lasting insecticide-treated nets years before the economics community caught up with this. And that's not a slag on any community in particular, but it's just a recognition of how hard it is for people to recognize, even at the very sophisticated levels of insight within their own fields, the insights that are being developed across fields that apply directly to their own. And so I think we have to understand how much evidence is out there that is simply not being implemented, either through lack of awareness <laughs> or through lack of financing. And if you look at agriculture, for example, and we've got a lot of momentum around Feed the Future, the African Green Revolution Initiative, uh, at a very simple level, and I won't get into all the complexity of soil nutrient challenges and, and so forth, nitrogen cycles, but the high-yield seed varieties for uh, African agriculture, loosely speaking, generally were uh, brought to market in the 1980s, roughly a generation after the ones from South Asia, uh, roughly one to two generations after those for, uh, say, Korea and Taiwan in the 1920s and 30s. There's actually a scientific history of high-yield seeds. Uh, there was no financing to support the fertilizer response of seeds, and there was no policy mechanism in the 1980s, and it's only a generation later that we're actually getting to the practicalities, in my read of the evidence, of supporting those seeds to be broadly accessible around the world and around Africa, and that's why we're seeing the things like the Malawi take off in agriculture. We're seeing many countries start to have massive uh, breakthroughs, not through any immediate technical breakthrough, but through the basic breakthrough of implementing the technology that was for a long time known in the agronomic community. And I, I just want to underscore how big a deal that is. There's a second set of issues, though, which I would say are around uh, the integrated challenges of innovation and implementing integrated approaches to uh, any particular innovation. So we were just hearing about sanitation. If you look at something like child mortality, uh, in my view, the ultimate bottom line measure of poverty. Uh, does a child make it to their fifth birthday or not? There's no more human consequence of poverty. Uh, there are so many factors that go into child mortality. It's not just a clinical service. <laughs> it's not just an immunization. Uh, it's not just the clean drinking water. Uh, it's not just adequate nutrition. Uh, it's not just is the community health worker there or is the clinician there. There's actually a whole suite of things that go into that outcome. The public health community has actually done quite a bit around this, but that's just one challenge. <laughs> If you want to look at the demand and supply side issues that put a kid in school, if you want to look at all the economic and ecological factors that go into <laughs> ecosystem management, if you want to look at uh, an issue like access to water, which is only partially about drinking water, especially in areas where the agricultural use of water is vastly increasing, hopefully rapidly <laughs> increasing in many instances, and also industrial uses, you have huge system questions. In our own work in the Millennium Villages, we're trying to think through uh, with communities, how to take what we already know based on the evidence to actually apply 
uh, local community managed system solutions, not with infinite complexity, but at least with enough uh, basic framework that there's a lot of local adaptation and uh, application of known technologies with a minimum, or a minimum and maximum in our case, uh, resource envelope to get those things done. There's a third set of innovations, which is what I would call around a particular, and I think the most interesting ones are around the very particular focused high impact technologies. And I, as a, an economist, define technology very broadly. It's skills, it's systems, it's science. So, uh, you know, the rotavirus uh, <laughs> uh, technologies are extremely important, high impact. Uh, technologies around uh, ICT and connectivity are extremely high impact. But we're, for example, working a lot with community health workers. My colleague Matt Berg has developed with our other colleagues this whole Child Count Plus system. There are places that never even had connectivity two years ago, where now you have people with primary, secondary education acting as community health workers that can do case management on a cell phone. That opens up huge new possibilities, but there are design challenges around what's the most effective type of information to collect uh, how do you, in a world where the smartphone is going to be coming just down the pipeline, anticipate that technology? How do you capture the simplest things where the broadband is about to come through too? And how do you do so in a way that the community has its impact empowerment in a way that is uh, optimal for longevity of any program? That's a whole other category of innovations that we are, I think, most of the time talking about. Uh, and it's crucial, but it's one of many. The fourth and final one I'll flag for now is what I would call uh, global learning systems. We are in the middle of uh, a revolution of global learning, and that's an innovation unto itself, in my view. I have been involved with uh, a couple dozen universities around the world in launching a new degree program. We call it the Masters in Development Practice, which is actually <coughs> about integrated science for development. And the thesis is that in order to be a good integrator of all the insights of the different disciplines, you actually need to know the basics of food systems. You know, need to know the basics of disease control. You need to know the basics of water management. You can't be an expert in all of those things, but you at least need to know the basics. And what's really interesting isn't just how quickly that idea has taken hold around the world uh, in our own experience, my own experience, and how resonant that concept is, but how much it's a collective learning effort. We're able to get uh, a couple dozen universities on the same screen through webcams once a week across time zones, so they have the same conversation. But imagine what that looks like if that uh, community in uh, a rural village or in a slum in Kibera or what have you is able to have their own conversation with USAID on a regular basis and also with DFID and the World Bank and the universities and the businesses all in the same time. This notion of collective global learning and I would say multi constituency learning across public, private, nonprofit, academic sectors is uh, not just the way the world is going, but in my view, it's also the way the world needs to go in order to solve a lot of these problems. And so I just, I want to encourage us to think broadly, not just about the very specific technical breakthroughs that are happening, but all these forms of breakthrough that I see happening uh, and that I think we need to understand as the world gets, uh, the world grapples with its complexity but also figures out how to design uh, systems that are innovative in their collaboration and sharing of insights, both uh, across disciplines and across communities around the world. Thanks. Thanks, John. I, I'm taking away th uh, three things from this conversation. And I, I'm hoping that each of you can maybe talk about each of them. One is, let's call it passing it on, global learning systems. How do you learn? How do you cross-fertilize? And I've got a specific, I want to press you on one thing, Alex, on that. Another one is on scale. <coughs> How do you achieve scale? You referenced that well, I'm going to pass this on to the private sector. I'd be very interested to hear about how do you, are these commercializable? Because I think this is, this I think hasn't come up in the conversation. How do you commercialize a technology, whether it's a pay, a pay toilet? We've all used pay toilets in places like Paris or other, other various places around the United States where you can do that. Maybe there's some, there's some kind of a, we talk about micro utilities in the development community and this is a form of a micro micro utility, right? And so, of that, and then I think the other is how do you measure impact and measurement and evaluation? How, where does that come in? I think especially in this environment where there's less foreign assistance resources, or there may be some, how do you make the case for your specific innovation or learning in this difficult environment? So, but Alex, 
Um, I'm going to be slightly wonky for a minute um, and talk about prize authority. You got something called prize authority, which maybe you might want to, maybe I'll explain. It's uh, having to do with uh, pr offering a prize for people to come up with a new development innovation. It, the good news is you have prize authority. Perhaps the, the bad news is it may be only limited to U.S. citizens, perhaps. I think is maybe you could just talk a little about that and why that's important to, to what you're doing. And maybe you could talk about how do you, and it seems to me that's part of this accelerated learning conversation. So uh, the, great, the, the great advantage of prizes is you get generally people investing 10 times the amount of the prize in actually trying to solve the problems. You find the people who tend to solve the prizes don't come from the communities you expect to actually address them. You get a huge amount of attention around the prize. So you create, actually, usually you don't end up with one solution. You create what is called an ecosystem of solutions. And lemur biologists, I also like to talk about ecosystems and evolutionary biology. But the idea is you don't have one widget. You don't have one solution. You don't have one system. But you have a series of different approaches that can compete and actually deal with the fact that you have different environments, different contexts, different cultures in which these things have to be in there. Um, and, and you know, so, so there's a good reason to have it. You want to draw attention. You want people to focus on a critical barrier. You only pay for success. So, you, you know, unlike a lot of development, you actually only pay for a prize when someone achieves the particular prize. And this was used with the Ansari X Prize for a spacecraft that was able to go to 100 kilometers twice within, I think, 10 days. Um, very clear definitions. We wanted to use prizes as a way of drawing attention to critical barriers as one of many tools. So our traditional grant tools to other things where we could broaden the conversation on development. The, the, the problem is the American Competes Act, which was just passed in the last flurry of legislation, uh, limits it so you cannot apply it to people in the developing countries. And th that is actually a real limitation because, quite frankly, what we want to do, this problem that you have, we have all sort of talked about of how do you actually find what solutions are out there? There are so many great existing solutions. How do you actually bring them forward? How, how, how do you actually bring sort of knowledge together? And, you know, you have this set of global challenges. Why aren't you using the entirety of the global community to try to address them? And so there is this limitation. We're looking at other ways of potentially addressing prizes through traditional grant authorities, through partnerships with other, uh, other entities that could actually fund the prize while we do the work to, to, to make it a reality. But I think it is sort of an exciting concept to be able to, to focus and, and to think about, you know, get people thinking about the particular problem without dictating the solution in advance. So private sector scale, how do you, how you, you're passing it on, talk, talk a little bit about, more about that. Sure, I think the one, and I'm going to speak mainly about sanitation because that's what I know about, but it can certainly be extrapolated to other technologies. But I think that one of the issues with sanitation and the way that it has been promoted in the world is that it's often very supply driven and less demand driven. So I think that really the key in going to scale is in creating the demand for the service. And there is a, an approach to sanitation, which is called CLTS, Community-Led Total Sanitation. And what this is, is instead of coming in with a, with a product or with an innovative technology, you really start by doing a social marketing campaign with the community. So you go in and you really the first thing is to draw the linkages, to, to connect the dots for people. So to talk about, for sanitation, this would be, what does sanitation actually impact? To bring to the forefront that link between sanitation and public health, and really get people to understand that. And to create within communities the desire to have a community where everyone has access to sanitation. So it's not just a recognition of the link between your own access to sanitation and your, your health, but also recognizing that other people in the community who do not have access to that are going to impact your health as well. So it creates within a community the desire to come up with solutions to provide sanitation to people. So for me, as someone who is specifically promoting a certain technology, it took me a little while to say, okay, well, even if I'm promoting ecological sanitation, 
I cannot go into a community and say, hey, we've got this straight, great toilet. You should try it. The first step that you really need to make is getting people interested in the idea of sanitation themselves. And then you can provide them with the different options that are out there. So I think that really the key to bringing an innovation to scale is first of all to create that, that demand by bringing up those linkages with, between the different domains of health and sanitation and agriculture. And I think that the second part of it is really doing social marketing. So you know, sanitation is something that people don't talk about very much. It's something that is not seen as cool. It's not, a, it's not something that's discussed. And something that we're really working on in Haiti right now is making sanitation cool in a way. So bringing in you know, doing <coughs> a marketing campaign that involves having celebrities in Haiti talk about sanitation, getting it, getting it out there, and making it something that people say, well, hey, that guy thought that that kind of toilet was pretty cool. I'd like to have one in my house as well. So in order to, in order to make, and make your, um, your innovative technology sustainable, you have to make people want to have it. You have to create a desire to pay for it. So sanitation is something that's never going to be free. And one of the things that Alex brought up was the idea of, you know, when do we, when do we get out of this? Is there an end goal in sight for aid? And I don't want to create an organization that in order for this technology to continue to serve people, our organization is going to need to continuously raise money for it into the future. So we really have to think about what are ways that this can be passed off to the communities in which we're working so that we can just demonstrate the technology, stimulate the, the desire for it and the demand for it, and demonstrate that it, it's something that can be profitable so that community groups, businesses will, will want to get involved with this. And certainly, waste collection in industrialized countries is huge business. And so there is absolutely no reason that that can't be the case in countries that have less access to sanitation. So from, from our particular perspective of sanitation, we're looking at social marketing, we're looking at creating demand, and we're looking at demonstrating a way that this can be profitable so that these implementations will actually be sustained in the future. And you don't just go put in 200,000 toilets that later on turn into storage sheds for people because they don't really have a desire to have that technology. So. Thanks. Mm -hmm. John, uh, we talked on the phone yesterday about demand-driven versus supply-driven. This has come up, this issue of we need to create demand. You, you, my understanding of how the Millennium Villages program works is you, you come to a community or a set of communities, you assess what the needs are. How do you generate demand for some of the solutions that you're providing? I think this is sort of an interesting, and some of them are new, new technologies, or how do you, and how do you, um, how do you uh, hope get folks to think differently about some of the challenges that they have? I think we have to segment this quite a bit, actually, because if you look at even the role of the public and private sector, just to weave that in, I think I'm a big fan of the private sector's uh, ability to innovate, generate new technologies, uh, solve uh, very market-driven problems where the markets are working quite well, or even expand the reach of the markets where they can work better, uh, the so-called bottom of the pyramid issues. Uh, in a loose, rough cut, I generally think of the bottom of the pyramid issues as applying to places that are between $1 and $2 a day. Uh, so they're a little bit liquid, there's some cash in the economy, and uh, there's a lot of room for entrepreneurialism. Uh, I think that there's typically a very different set of economic dynamics in places that are below a dollar a day, which are often pretty much cash-free economies or very illiquid, or highly illiquid, and uh, people just don't have the resources to pay for things in the same way. So I think that's one cut uh, different issues. Then there's another cut of things that are uh, behavioral, uh, like sanitation is one of the great examples. There are other things where it's about uh, you might n not want your immunization program to be based on uh, a purely demand-driven approach. And there's a lot of public health where y you don't want you know, pure voting at the household level. Uh, does the child vote for whether they want an immunization uh, or does their parent decide for them? 
Uh, and do you want everyone basically to have an immunization in order to have the public good effects that come from mass immunization? Uh, it's a different class of problem, actually. And what it, the innovation might be is about changing what's in the immunization or uh, changing the sequencing of the immunization. And, and it's ju I just think it's important to segment that from, for example, uh, a sanitation problem. It, I think when we look at these scaling issues, I don't want us to walk away, from, as much as I'm a great believer in the private sector, <laughs> walk away from the public finance. And I feel like we have a bit of cognitive dissonance on this. So we don't expect, for example, uh, PEPFAR to be uh, financed, the US AIDS program, very successful, to be financed by the private sector. Uh, nor do we expect uh, the AIDS widows and orphans to get their antiretrovirals uh, through private financing. Uh, we, ex we understand that they need public financing because they actually can't afford it, and that program won't work uh, in the absence of public finance. And we don't expect PEPFAR to self-finance within three years. That's not our definition of sustainability. Definition of sustainability is with the ongoing financing, does that program still achieve its objectives? And does local management work? And are the targets being achieved? And uh, is this growing in the right way? And so I think we need to unpack even how we think of scaling and sustainability in these in a, a more deliberate way. Given that frame, we see within the Millennium Villages all sorts of different issues, as one can imagine. So there are some places where the farmers had, of course, seen fertilizer before. They might have used it a little bit before. They just couldn't afford to buy it. <laughs> Uh, or they couldn't afford it at the new prices, or uh, it used to be subsidized, now it's not subsidized. Uh, they might know how to do it, but they might benefit from the agricultural extension worker just to make sure they're doing the spacing right. Uh, and you saw, we saw many places do very well with just a little bit of a tweak around what was accessible. Uh, so there wasn't really a big demand problem, actually, although there was a, a complementarity issue around how to make sure that the, the technical support was there so that they could do it the most effective way. Uh, you see other issues, for example, everywhere with mass distribution of bed nets, just to stick with that example. Uh, I think the evidence is very clear that you need to do mass distribution of bed nets. That doesn't mean that that solves the entire malaria problem, both because you have to break the transmission cycle through medication treatment. You have to make sure people know how to use their net. You have to make sure they know how to maintain their net. Uh, you have to make sure that, uh, you know, in my view, you want to keep the price basically zero so you're not creating a secondary market for the net. Uh, you know, all these things are very effective, and that means you need a system around it. That's not necessarily, one could define that as creating demand. One could also define that as designing a system that's efficacious. There are other things which are about choosing technologies. Again, all these categories. So we have to be very careful not to oversimplify any of this. Like water. Well, what is the type of water source that people want to use? What's the uh, technology they want to use? What's the one that people want to maintain? It's, of course, not just about the capital investment. It's about how to maintain it, how to make sure the skill level is there. We've seen uh, in some places uh, communities, of course, have their own choices of what types of uh, water they use. In others, uh, for example, in southwest Uganda, uh, it's very slopey. People didn't really live there 50 years ago. There's been mass erosion. And uh, they said, you know, fertilizer, not so relevant for us because it just lost in runoff anyways. Water, we need water. And of course, we need to pump the water up the hills. So can we find a way to create pumps uh, to get the water and then we'll do our landscape management as our first priority in agriculture? So I think these have to be both globally at the country level and at the community level, highly iterative conversations. Uh, here's what's available. Here's what can be done. Uh, here's what the community wants to do. Uh, no conversation has perfect information. No conversation has uh, unanimity in any part of life, uh, or rarely. <laughs> but uh, there's really a very iterative process to learning and to documenting. And I think that's why this kind of forward-looking innovation strategy is so important, because uh, even if something's your best estimate the first time, your best estimate the second time should hopefully be even better. <laughs> And then the, not just the solution will evolve, but the problem will evolve. And uh, I think the more dynamic and segmented an approach we have to these problems with very, uh, very collaborative problem solving, the more efficacious, again, we'll be in all of it. Great. I, and I know there's a very well-informed audience, so I want to take advantage of the fact that we have some very thoughtful people. And I see some hands starting to shoot up. Um, we, have, we have a couple microphones. Uh, I'll ask folks, folks to identify themselves, name and who, who their organization, 
And if they would please keep their question in the form of a brief question as opposed to a statement or speech. Yeah. So the l lady in the second row. Thank you. Yeah, it's on. Uh, absolutely fascinating panel. Congratulations. This has been really interesting. And yeah, sorry, name? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Marisa Lino, and I'm with Northrop Grumman Corporation, and you may all wonder why a defense contractor might be interested in this topic, but we are the largest uh, contractor at CDC, and we do work with CDC in 40 countries on global health. Mm. Anyway, my question is for Alex, and um, it gets to the heart of integrating knowledge for use in development, and I'm wondering, <laughs> Uh, as you look at reforming USAID, as the president has announced in the State of the Union, reorganizing government, uh, I'm struck that perhaps the model that Ambassador Holbrook created for Pakistan, AFPAC uh, development, where he brought in people from all the different government agencies, because the biggest stumbling block when you look at public financing, even if it is public private sector that may mm -hmm. implement it, is how do you get all the various parts together? Is that kind of a model, maybe based on that particular personality, uh, can it be repeatable? Can you do something on a task force basis that, uh, that might create the synergies you all are talking about? So bring bringing various government agencies together. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big admirer of Holbrook, I w used to work for Dennis Ross, and I was the representative to his office, and, uh, and I'm a deep believer in much of what he did. Uh, fundamentally, absolutely. That, that is exactly, I think, the right approach in terms of we have to be more efficient in what we have to do in development. We have to make use of every resource we have available to us to provide value to the taxpayers and to provide value to our, our development constituents, the people you know, the people in the developing country that we're working for. So, you know, USAID is working right now. We, we are talking to NASA, we're talking to NOAA, we're, you know, we're talking to USGS, which has huge expertise in remote sensing and water and geology. You know, we are, we are building partnerships with all those organizations, along with NIH, uh, along with USDA, uh, fundamentally to be able to, to, to address these problems because they're, they're global problems. I think I saw a, a question up here in the front row as well. Uh, my name is uh, Wellington Chaliwumbe. I'm uh, a venture capitalist in uh, Johannesburg in uh, South Africa. I have got uh, economics training and I'm also passionate about development. And actually the business that I'm in is a result of uh, an intros introspective uh, debate uh, on uh, what drives economic growth uh, and development. And uh, the conclusion that I came to is uh, similar to <coughs> the uh, focus of the panel today, which is that technology is the factor of production that has made the biggest difference in the history of the world economy. Now, I've been listening to you talk about what you're busy with and uh, the views that you've got. And it seems to me that your bias is very much uh, towards being a substitute for developing country governments where there's a deficit of transfer payments you know, that would, in a developed country setting, uh, be provided by government you know, to the most vulnerable groups. And uh, in general, uh, economic viability in that section of the community is very difficult to manufacture because you know, the reason why they're vulnerable is because you know, they no don't have money and because they don't, they're, they're, uh, there's no market there. What we have decided to do in our case is to make the developing world also a source of global technologies. And my question is, I wanted to know whether there is a solution or a form of intervention that you think you can provide to venture capitalists like me. I've got four technologies that have proven their potential to be global solutions. We have got a ballast water treatment system, which is killing microbes in the water that goes into ballast tanks in the shipping industry, a 35 billion US dollar industry. And we have partnered with uh, the biggest marine repair and maintenance company in the world, which is Norwegian. 
despite the fact that we invested only half a million US dollars in the investment, demonstrating that actually high value uh, innovation. So Wellington, so, so the question is, the question would be? Uh, well, I, you know, one of the, I, I know that you don't want speeches, but one of the points that you've made correctly is how do you identify quality of opportunities? Well, I do have quality opportunities. Okay. So, you know, that's the, f uh, the point I want to make. Maybe we can talk about yep. the rest of them uh, later on. Yep. But I just wanted to know whether there is an intervention that you have got for things that are genuinely potentially viable, can actually grow the economy, so that in the future sustainability will be defined as developing countries having the capacity to provide their own transfer payments to the vulnerable groups in their own countries rather than you know, aid, USAID being an extension Great. of domestic country governments. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Wellington. I actually think each of you could probably take a piece of this. Maybe, Alex, why don't you start? And I'm hoping also that, Sasha, I, I think you talked originally about how you found the technology in South Africa and brought it to Haiti. So it sounds as if there are, there are pieces about how do you commercialize the technology, how do you scale it, and how do you bring in governments? How do you bring in local governments into into this conversation, because I think you put your finger on something, Wellington, which is uh, where, where's the local governments in this conversation? And so, and, and also maybe you could talk about how, how are you supporting commercializing, commercializing technology? Because I think that's also something that Wellington was getting at. Um, I, one is a personal observation. So a very good friend of mine at the World <laughs> Bank that works on science is, and I'm not going to mention his name, but is leaving the World Bank to go work for venture capital firms in Silicon Valley who are interested in the developing world. And if you talk to, to the smart investors around the world, the, the future markets are in Africa. You know, they, they, they are in, it is, it is where people see the hope and the success. And that's where, you know, the drive for development is going to come from. The second point is recognizing where Agent development agencies, even what we're trying to create is what we're calling a modern development enterprise, can distort the market and where we shouldn't be acting. And how do we actually encourage the venture capitalists and the entrepreneurs like yourself? And, and we're still working on this, but one of the mechanisms that, that you know, my colleague, uh, Dr. Moore O'Neill, who's our chief innovation officer and we work closely together, is this thing called the Development Innovation Ventures, which is intended to be able to take those new developments, those new sort of technologies, those new ideas from anyone. And if they have the potential to reach 75 million people, to start off like a venture capital fund to scale them up. And that's available now. It's rolling applications. So that's some of the ways we're thinking about. But we also have to be careful of not distorting markets, you know, which I think aid has the potential to do as well, not just USAID, but other development agencies. You just talk also, Alex, about you have, I think part of your office also covers working with local scientists in developing countries as well. Could you just speak to that? I mean, that's fundamental about how do you actually build up capacity <coughs> for people to solve their own problems. And this is why, you know, through the National Science Foundation, our, you know, one of our premier science agencies, you know, we want to partner American scientists with developing country scientists so that they're both, you know, so you're building labs, you're, you're creating postdocs, you're buying equipment helping individuals, just like we do with our scientists, be able to address the same set of problems and create world-class world laboratories. The other piece of it is thinking about digital libraries. And we were successful in doing this in Iraq when everyone told us that it wouldn't work. We created a virtual science library. 100% of Iraqis have access. Uh, Iraqi students and all their science ministries have access to it. The best part about it was people said, well, they don't have electricity and they don't have internet, You'll, and they're not interested in using this. And what we found was, despite electricity, despite internet, that people took the challenges and turned them into opportunities. And we have 8,000 to 10,000 active users. If you don't use it, you're kicked off. 35,000 articles a month that are downloaded. Uh, 1.2 million or 1.3 million over the course of it. And what's even better is we did it at 95% discounts using open source software platforms that, were, that can be adapted and have been now taken up by other countries. And now the Iraqi government pays for it as opposed to USAID or the US government. And that, to me, is a sign of, of, of success. And it's also a sign that people have a thirst for knowledge in the developing world. It, you know, if you talk to people, scientists around the world, they're reading abstracts. They don't have access to these things. You give them the knowledge, they will use it, and they will want it. Great. 
So Sasha, talk about where, how's the local government play into what you're doing, because I think this is an important point. And then how are, how are you reaching out to commercializing your ideas? I think this was something else that Wellington talked about. He has a series of his ideas. But my hope is that at some point you'll, you'll find a venture capitalist for, uh, for paid toilets. Uh, so. Yes, well, Wellington, I'm, I'm very glad that you brought up the issue of governments, because it's something the role can't be underplayed. <coughs> and I feel like it's something that I, I may have skimmed over in my initial discussion. And I think that certainly, when you're working in a country like Haiti, where many people are, are living on such a small income, and you're talking about a very basic service like sanitation, which actually does cost money, um, that absolutely the government is going to have to be involved. And certainly, sanitation is subsidized by governments in most countries. So we've been trying to work closely not only with the government water and sanitation authority but also the ministry of agriculture to find a way to sort of develop a, a public private partnership where the ngo like ourselves would come in we would demonstrate a technology the way in which it works and then there would be certain parts of it which could be operated by the private sector like for instance the collection and transport but then when you look at something like waste treatment, this is something that is much better initially run by the government. So you're talking about semi-centralized waste treatment plants where it costs a lot of money to get that sort of infrastructure in place. And that is money that you're not going to be able to get from your customers who are paying for their toilets. So I think that there is a real need to come up with creative ways that the NGO community, the government, and the private sector can work together to provide this service and to really ensure that the service is not only available to people who are able to pay for it. So there needs to be some thinking about subsidization for people who cannot afford the entire cost of the service. Um, and the interesting thing about ecological sanitation is because you're not just providing toilets, you're also producing a resource in the end. Are there creative ways that profits that come from the sales of that resource can then be fed back into the system to actually subsidize the provision of sanitation services to people? So I really I thank you for bringing that up, and uh, I appreciate the question. John, role of local governments, and also how do, you, how do we commercialize? How do we people have good ideas, have good marketable solutions? How, how should those be? How should those be brought forward? I think uh, I'd have two basic thoughts on this. One is again segmenting the different environments. So I actually think the middle-income countries have a very different environment and set of challenges than the low-income countries. So South Africa is a middle-income country, or Brazil, or even now India. Uh, Ghana is now technically a middle-income country, if if we believe the books. Uh, you know, these are uh, very different environments in terms of the capital that's in that uh, environment and economy and generally speaking, the technology, because you're absolutely right. The, one of the deepest insights of a, the economic growth research is that gains in technology and productivity drive everything. And so finding ways to boost that is central. I actually think that with the uh, emerging economy, so-called the BRICS and BRIC pluses and whatever acronym you want to use, we're in the, this country, we're so used to describing them as the next great investment places. I think we have to be understanding them as also the next great investment sources because they're really providing a bridge function in the global economy. And as wages keep going up in China and a lot of the low cost labor will move to other parts of the world, for example, that's going to be a huge shift in investment in the next generation. But I also think we need to, I think there's a gap system-wide internationally around innovations. So we don't really have uh, a lot of these public finance dollars going into innovations because they're risky. Taxpayers don't like to see their dollars fail. We do domestically, in, or this country domestically puts, for example, a lot of money into NIH, National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation. Those are central to all the commercialized technology you see down the pipeline, the basic science but we don't have those similar pipelines in the low-income countries, although we're starting to see them in many of the middle-income countries, and there's a lot of boosting happening for the low-income countries. But I just want to share some basic arithmetic to illustrate some of this. 
When we're talking about foreign aid and, and so forth, I never think we should be thinking of substitutes. I think we should only be thinking of complements. So these are links in a chain, and it's a little bit like uh, I always say, do I like my heart, my lungs, or my liver best? I actually <laughs> like them all. And if I want to run a clinic, do I, or if I want someone to be able to run a clinic, do I want there to be a nurse or running water or medicine? Well, I actually think they should have all of them. And one of the basic challenges, and those are analogies for a lot of these problems, if you're looking at the lowest income countries, the bottom billion so-called, they're typically in economies that are maybe $400 per capita income. Technically, and a lot of that's imputed value of what the agriculture would be worth if they sold it rather than eating their own food. If you were to do really well and squeeze 15% of GNP and tax revenues, you might be getting you know, $50, $60, maybe 70 of per capita uh, income for tax, for expenditures, for everything, for your health clinics, your schools, your roads, your judiciary, everything. That's not much. Now, what we've done a lot of work on this in the past several years. We've estimated that the total cost, if you want to use the Millennium Development Goals as a frame, the total cost of the agriculture support, the education, the infrastructure, the health, and so forth, in a bare bones way, is probably on the order of 100 to $150 per person per year which is almost nothing unless you're at a $400 or $500 per capita economy and your tax base is maybe 60 bucks per person. That is so incalculably different in a spirit from being at $5,000 per capita where getting 10% of uh, GNP, which is low as tax revenues, means that you're at $500 per capita if you're not doing as well on effort, but you have so much more to play with in a sense. And so I think it's really important to understand that it's not a foreign aid and official development assistance is in no way uh, a substitute or shouldn't be for the private finance and the incentives, nor is it a letting off the hook a low-income country to do their best. It's got to be best from everyone. But you know, no one more than me, and I spent a lot of time arguing the case for foreign aid, <laughs> I don't want a penny more than what's needed to solve the problems. And I, as a general rule, speaking very roughly but just conceptually, Countries really graduate on the low income side from the need for foreign aid once they get above about $1,000 per capita GNP. So in my view, we should really be focusing the dollars on an aid basis in those countries and really supporting the private investment in the ones that are more advanced in the middle income. And, and we need to just see that those aren't the same problem. I'm just, I'm time sensitive. I'll make a deal with the audience. If you ask very brief questions, I'll take two more questions. So name who you're with, and a very brief question will take two. The gentleman in that corner, and anybody over here, uh, uh, and I'll go over here, so I'll be, <coughs> I'll um, hit both sides. I'm Ranjan Gupta from NIAID, NIH, but I'm speaking for myself, not for NIH. Uh, I just wanted to say this was an excellent panel because you all touched on some very key issues. One was Sasha, demand, create the demand to, to drive the process. You talked about the people thirst for knowledge, and the social entrepreneurship. And I just want to make a quick point that I go to India for my scientific th issues uh, periodically, and I'm always amazed that I go to houses where people have, even the rickshaw puller on the street has a cell phone. People have, every house nowadays has an LCD monitor, flat screen TV, and I walk out of their house as an open hydrant with mosquitoes flying everywhere, which goes to show that people do not have the knowledge th and the awareness to say, well, this is a basic necessity. And the second thing is that the political will is not there. Oftentimes, local and state governments are so caught up fighting their political issues, they don't have incentive to do things that will be for the public good. But here's what I have a message, is that I found, talking to average Indian on the street, that people love American shows. You know, when they watch National Geographic, when they watch Animal Planet, they say, you know, I never knew that these things need to be protected. The, the education that they receive, or something like, let's say, if it's Sesame Street. So basically, a social entrepreneurship is a social engineering, making a cultural change from bottoms up. And I think US can really do that by infiltrating into that mode. You know, have all, people even don't understand what HIV AIDS is. And we have tons of good, and TV shows, this, that, or, uh, you know, films, education. <coughs> you can really make that change so much so that people can then demand that they want that, and maybe then the po politicians will feel, here's something I can do so that I can stay in power. 
Thank so you. To change the political That's great. Thank you. I'm going to ask that the gentleman over there to make a last comment. Of course, you know many of the Sesame Street programs around the world, aside from the U.S. one, are funded by AID, where helps yes. that Alam Simpson and and others. So, yeah, in Russia as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Zach Sarno. I'm with the Public International Law and Policy Group, and I was just wondering if you could speak to the use of innovations in legal service delivery as part of the holistic element of sort of aid in general. Innovations in public public service delivery. Uh, legal service Not delivery. Legal service <laughs> delivery. <laughs> if you use them at all or if you're aware of them, like mm. paralegals as a form of legal aid, like community health workers as opposed to doctors. Yeah. or. I know of some innovative work that's been done, especially in post-conflict settings in uh, places like Liberia and Sierra Leone. And there's some great uh, young lawyers who have been doing what I would call interface law between community legal systems and the kind of more uh, classic if you will, uh, internationally defined formal systems and bridging that through community tribunals and things. I'm not expert in that, so I wouldn't want to overstate. Great. I think uh, we've had an excellent panel. I want to thank our sponsors, the uh, University of Miami and, and our friends here at CSIS. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Okay. All of us together. Oh, sure. Okay.